Hallelujah. How many of y'all are glad to be loved today? How many of y'all feel loved? Be real with me. Raise your hand if you feel loved. Okay. How many of y'all feel loved by God? Raise your hand. Okay. Hallelujah. Glory to God. That's good. Well, I believe you're even going to feel be feel more uh, uh, in love with God uh, than, than you are right now. Hallelujah. Because God really does love us. And before I get started on the message today, you know, this is going to be Vision Sunday. But I noticed as I was riding down the road going to uh, Florida, I never passed out the vision list. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> guess what we're going to do? We're going to postpone Vision Sunday for a couple weeks to give you guys an opportunity. Because this is a big deal, y'all. This is a big deal to write down your vision and make it plain. Okay? And it don't matter how little it is. It don't matter how long it is. But you may have a vision in your heart that you want to see come to pass. Maybe it was if some loved ones could get saved. Maybe, maybe it's a, a job opportunity to open up. Maybe it's a vacation you want to go to. Maybe it's a raise you want at work. Maybe it's you want your car paid off. Maybe it's you want your house paid off, okay? We know how we feel about debt around here. We hate debt. Hate it with a passion, okay? And I want everybody out of debt. That means you have no debt at all. Oh, Pastor, I don't see how that's going to work. Well, God will help you, amen? But you need to write it down. Let's take it before the Lord. So in two weeks, I want you to bring these back, and then we're all going to present our vision list to the Lord Almighty, amen? And we're going to believe God that these things are going to change, amen? How many of y'all would like to see some debts removed this time next year than they are right now? A few of you, okay? Well, I promise you, if you'll do this and you'll present it to God, watch what happens, amen? I got mine right over my desk, right on my desktop. I'm looking at it all the time. I see it all the time, and I'm seeing things happen because I keep it before me, okay? And I just uh, I, I want to encourage you to do that. So, uh, ushers, if we could have some ushers come in here. Hallelujah. Ross, you've been doing a real good job handing out. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. And then I'm also going to need, uh, Andrew, are you, are you usher? Okay, I'm going to give you something, too. We're all going to be busy here today. Hallelujah. Because we've got a separate thing we're going to do. Well, I think we're going to do something else today. Well, you got a lot. Yours is two pages. So I'm going to give them one top page and one bottom page, Ross. You should have one of those and then one of the, one of the others. So anybody that wants one, just raise your hand. We're not going to force you to do it. And then the next thing uh, that Andrew's going to be handing out, <laughs> Operation Andrew. <laughs> it's not really, <laughs> it's kind of funny, you know, really. Uh, <coughs> I didn't plan it that way. <laughs> but uh, Operation Andrew was a follower of Christ in the Bible, okay? Do you feel like that? Me too. Yeah. We got one that was in the Bible. We got one that ain't in the Bible. He'll be there. Well, I'll be in there one day. But anyway, Operation Andrew is a ministry that uh, Billy Graham started years ago. Whenever he would go into a city to do a crusade, he would actually send these to pastors and leaders in an area, and he would have them give to his congregation or their congregation to actually, you know, write down the names of people to pray and bring, okay? Our goal this year for, for Easter Sunday is to fill this house up to where it's just jam-packed that all the members are having to stand along the walls, okay, because we need seats for people to sit here. This is our goal. This is what we want to do. It ain't going to just happen by us just thinking about it. We're going to have to be proactive, and it starts with praying, you know, knowing some people in your family, friends. We're going to write their names down, and then you're going to be praying for them all the way up until Easter, but you want to actually have be, be proactive. You want to be able to text them and stuff, okay? Text them, invite them. What if they say no? Invite them again. What if they say no? Invite them again, okay? Uh, just stay with it, but pray first before you start asking. So Andrew's got those, and he'll hand out all y'all that, that want one. Hey, let me get one, Andrew. I'm going to get one. Here you go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But we want to, hey, let's all pull together, man, because you never know, man. That could be the Sunday uh, that their life turns around. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And we also have these invite cards, too, back there on the table. Man, get out and invite some people to church, man. Let's do this thing, guys. I'm telling you, we're doing this for the Lord. We're not doing this for man. Glory to God, because we want the Lord to actually touch people's lives. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, glory to God. How many of y'all are expecting today? Hallelujah. You should always come to church expecting God to do something. Hallelujah. Expect it. Even if you sit there, and again, I'm a preacher that won't call you out, so if your eyes are halfway open, I'm, I, I got you. I feel you, man. Just hang in there. We, we, we good, okay? Even if you fall asleep, hey, man, enjoy it. I'd rather you fall asleep in here than stay at home. Glory to God. I, I look at it this way. Hey, look, man, it's better to sleep in the house of the Lord than to forsake the house of the Lord. So, hey, there's no shame going on in here, okay? I know what it's like to work all week and, and deal with kids and, 
you know, kids. <laughs> I know. I mean, hallelujah. I, I feel for some parents that have many more. Okay. Uh, we just make some more copies. Cody can make us some more copies. Hey, Cody, how you doing, brother? Glory to God. Man, you, I know your wife's healed, healthy, and whole. Amen. And while we're doing that, also a little FYI for your information, okay? Y'all do know that the, that the Bible says that in the last days there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, right? And there's also going to be plagues, plagues that will be released on the land, okay? So if we already know that that's going to happen, God's already got our medication ready for us, okay, to take on a daily basis. So I'm going to encourage everybody every day, okay, to begin to look at Psalms 23 and Psalms 91. Now, I know many of y'all are going to just memorize that in your head, okay? Don't, don't ever write it down, okay? You'll need to come to church ready to write notes, okay? If I have to do it in a conference, y'all got to do it here, okay? And I hate taking notes, brother. I hate it. <laughs> I'm not. She's a good note taker. I'm not. But anyway, Psalms 91 and Psalms 23, don't try to memorize it. That's not the goal. The goal is to get it in your heart to where you see yourself walking in those psalms. You see yourself walking in the protection of the Lord. Amen? And to stand your ground that when a sore throat or runny nose comes at you, you know what to do. Run to your Father. Hallelujah. You have protection. I have protection. And I want us to be prepared because, again, the enemy is going to try to keep the men and women of God away from being together. So these plagues are going to come out. I mean, I've even heard uh, through, you know, good sources that the plague, and this is from doctors now, this is from doctors that are talking about how that they're already developing a new plague or a new virus to be released that's supposed to be way stronger than COVID. But that's for all those that are on the outside looking in. It ain't for us, hallelujah. And those that are hurting, they need to see people walking in the protection of God. So again, Psalms 23, Psalms 91, begin to start, you know, spending some time looking at that on a daily basis, on a daily basis. It will help you out. Well, glory to God. Well, we also have something coming up called a date night. I sent a text in church out, and we had two couples step up and go, you know what, we're going to go. We're going to go. And I appreciate that, okay? But I know there's more than two couples in here. Hallelujah. And we want to plan it because uh, it's going to be a nice evening. We're going to have some food. I think it's a shakuri board is what we're going to have, shakuri. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm saying. Y'all get it, okay? Y'all know what kind of board it is, okay? It's going to be one of those boards. You're going to have food. You're going to have. It's all provided free of charge. Ain't going to cost you a dime. And then we're going to have a, a, a good uh, good night. Uh, we're going to open up the Bible and, and share a few things with you guys that I hope will strengthen your relationship. Uh, but uh, you know, make plans. Go ahead, man, and, and let us know you're coming. Hallelujah, glory to God. We want to we want to make plans for you to be here. Okay, so let's get into this today. Okay, <clears throat> now obviously we were gone this week. Okay, for a whole week, we went to a conference this week. And in this conference, um, the speaker was Keith Moore, okay? And I told y'all last week that I would actually um, share with you guys a respected voice in the body of Christ. Now, y'all heard one Wednesday, okay? How many of y'all was here Wednesday? Did y'all hear Tony Evans, okay? Now, that's a respected voice in the body of Christ, okay? I love Mr. Tony Evans, okay? And, and his daughter can preach too, Priscilla, okay? She can bring it to the house. So those are, those are just a couple, but this, this man right here and his wife, Phyllis, if you could go ahead and pull that picture up, Keith and Phyllis Moore, okay? Uh, it's morelife.org, but when you go to that, it's going to be Faith Life Church, Sarasota, or Faith, Faith Life Church, Branson. Um, all of his material is free, okay, everything. He taught for, for many years in a Bible college, Raymond Bible School in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He taught healing school for many, many years, and then he also traveled with a general in the faith, Kenneth E. Hagan, for 20-plus years, right beside somebody that was used mightily, that, that, that was, you know, had three visitations of the Lord and was told to take his people faith, take the message of faith to his people. So this couple right here uh, is, is where we was at, and he ministered all week. Now, this church is going to be coming up underneath their ministerial association, okay? He has now been directed by the Lord to, uh, you know, he's been doing this for about, I think he started in 2021, but uh, the Lord directed him to, to make a place for ministers and begin to start empowering ministers and speaking to ministers. So we, as a church, are going to bring this church up underneath 
Faith Life International, which it just means we have more people that we're part of. We have a good covering that we're part of because he's solid, okay? And I want to encourage you that if you want to go deeper in the Word, go to morelife.org, hit Word Supply at the top. He has it all in, in alphabetical order on every topic you could ever imagine, okay, that you can learn if you want to go deeper, okay? And it's all free. It costs you nothing. It don't mean it didn't cost him something. It did, all right? Well, this week when we was there, <coughs> he was directed of the Lord to, because uh, every time he has these conferences, he'll have a goal set that they'll actually be raising money for. Well, he has a plane. So if you have a problem with a preacher having a plane, you're going to have a problem with this guy, okay? He has a plane. He has a really nice plane. He also has a really nice Harley Davidson. Hallelujah. It's a really nice Harley Davidson, okay? But again, um, his plane's not used for him to fly all over the Caribbeans and go to, uh, you know, vacations. His plane is to get the gospel out. And that's what he does. He takes the gospel all over, and he takes it free of charge. That means when he comes to a place, like if he was to come minister here, he charges nothing. He takes care of everything. He takes care of the flight there. He takes care of the hotel. No charge. He don't charge anybody nothing. Okay, that's the way it should be. All right? You go going to places, they want to charge you $200 or $100 or $50. Jesus, how much did he charge? I'm being honest with you guys. <laughs> and, and the reason why I say that, because it seems like when you let the Lord move on the hearts of the people to give, big things happen when that happens. Okay? So we're in this meeting, and he had originally thought that we was going to all have a goal of, of, of paying off the plane that they actually got about a year and a half ago or whatever. But the Lord directed him to go a different direction. And he said he wanted us to raise the money for a... Uh, a couple named Tony and Patsy Caminetti, they, uh, they do Bible colleges in uh, Australia, they do Bible colleges in uh, Singapore, Italy, and they've actually started a new work, it's only a few years old, in Papua New Guinea. You may say, well, where's that at? I don't know, okay? I just did the research on it. Over 70% of the people that live in Papua New Guinea don't have electricity. So you talk about real, true third world country, that's a true world, third world country, amen? So he directed them and he said that all the money that comes in this week, we're going to send it to them so that they can actually build their headquarters in Australia. It's kind of a little, you know, uh, not good, okay? And, and, and it's not theirs. And how many of you know that God wants us to have our own? He don't want us to have to, to be renting and stuff because when you rent, you could get kicked out of that place you're in, Right? So anyway, he, uh, he directed all of us that, hey, look, this week, every night, we're going to take up an offering and we're going to give it to them. His goal was $3 million that he wanted us to raise, $3 million, okay? That sounds like a lot of money, but it's not really a lot of money. So anyway, we started, and then by Thursday night, by people just giving, okay, they had $1.3 or $1.4 million had come in just in four nights. <laughs> How do you think Tony and Patsy Caminiti were feeling with this was being popped up on the screen? Probably feeling pretty good, amen? Well, guess what? This is the scripture that the Lord directed him to use, and it's, it's found in First, I think, Second Samuel 17. Hallelujah. This was the whole theme for the whole week, amen? It says, Moreover, I, God, will appoint a place for my people Israel, and we're adopted into the family, y'all, okay? We're part of the Israel family, and we'll plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own. And move no more, nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously. Just leave that scripture up, okay? That we would have a place of our own. So what are we doing, okay? All that week, we was actually helping raise money for them to have a place of their own. Well, if you know anything about the kingdom of God, what you help make happen for somebody, God makes happen for you. Amen? And that was the thing the Lord just dropped in my heart. said, okay, Revolution Church needs a place of their own. So what if we help them get a place of their own? What's God going to do for Revolution Church? He's going to help us get a place of their own. This was no, this was no, uh, you know, accident that this happened. This was ordained by God for us to be there and to be able to plant a seed from this family right here, okay, in that ministry to see them get their place, and in essence, we're going to get our place. I share that with you because I believe that this is the year we're going to see us get our own. Amen. How many of y'all believe that with me? Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. All right. Well, 
got some work to do. Hallelujah. We want everybody with us. Hallelujah. Amen. And not only did we do this from the ministry, we did this out of our own personal finances too. Because how many of y'all know I want a place of my own? I want to own my house. Amen. And when I see a flow of God, that's how God blesses his people. You give, and then he brings it back to you. It's called seed, time, and harvest. You plant an apple seed, what do you get? Apples, amen? You plant an orange seed, what do you get? You get oranges, amen? So when you plant a seed to help somebody else get their own, you know that God is setting you up to help you get your own, amen? Glory to God. So anyway, we was excited about that. It was just a great week, glory to God. And... Uh, we're excited about it. I hope you guys are excited about us too. I mean, I'm fired up. I'm ready to go. I think God is getting ready to do some amazing things in this ministry. Amen? And he's going to do some amazing things through you as well. Well, let's get into the message today. God loves you. He loves you guys. He loves you a bunch. Amen? Next Wednesday is Valentine's Day. And millions of couples will celebrate that day in many ways. A lot of pressure on the guys right now, okay? A lot of pressure. Clock's ticking. Some of y'all have already got something. Some of y'all can you ain't going to get nothing. Some of y'all are thinking, what are you going to get? So there's going to be many couples that go out to eat, buy flowers, buy gifts, balloons, heart-shaped pizza, on and on and on. Amen. You see Papa John's heart-shaped pizza. You see Chick-fil-A, heart-shaped chicken nuggets. Everything's a heart shape, okay? Everything's a heart shape. And again, those flowers, I've been in Publix, okay, and I've seen the men walking around grabbing flowers. You know what's going on, man. Come on. You know, they just hoping none of their buddies are in there seeing them grab the flowers, really. You know what I'm saying? They just, okay, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> and then, of course, you get to the counter and say, ah, you buying that for your wife? <laughs> yeah, I am. Hallelujah. Uh, but uh, anyway, there's going to be a lot of money spent. Billions of dollars will be spent to hopefully show that special person in your life that you love them so much. I'm not against showing love for each other because Jesus told us to love one another, but to put so much emphasis on one day a year is mighty convenient for all those wanting to make money. Okay? And I did a little research on Valentine's Day. And I really believe, like most days, that they start out as a good thing. Because if you really go back to the root of Valentine's Day, it was really uh, three people, uh, you know, that... I think they had Valentine or Valentinus. They were at, one of them was a martyr for Christ, okay? And the other ones, one was a priest that he died for Christ. So they, they all had a, a, a cause that they were living for that was not with flowers and balloons, okay? But over the years, we see uh, the culture, we see uh, materialism, we see the world grab it for benefit, for worldly gain, okay? And again, I'm not against, you know, Valentine's Day, but really every day should be Valentine's Day. If I only got one day to show her I love her, I wouldn't even be married to me, okay? Again, every day I want to show her I love her. I want every day to be a Valentine's Day, amen? Amen? And, and uh, Am I okay? Are we good? <laughs> I feel like I'm standing up here by myself, y'all. Come on, hallelujah. Help me out, man. Love is something we should show every day of the year to each other. Special occasions do merit special attention, and we should go all out on those special days. But what would our relationship look like if we had random days of celebration of the love for each other? Just random days that we loved each other. Then, you know, anniversary, birthday. I mean, come on. There's special days that, hey, look, go all out. Enjoy it. You know what I'm saying? But what if we did this all the time? Does God do this with us all the time? Yes, he does. He don't have special days of the year that he's going to love you more than he does the other day. No. You can always know that God is celebrating you every day of your life. And he wants to do good for you every day of your life. Amen? Amen. Jesus says something very important in John 13, 33. He said, Dear children, I will be with you only a little longer. And as I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me. But you can't come where I'm going so now I am giving you a new commandment, love each other just as I have loved you, you should love each other. So love is not a day, it's a lifestyle, it's what we do as Christians. Now before Christ, we do a lot of things that we shouldn't do, okay? We love those that love us, we do good for those that do, do good to us. We kind of like return what has been, been done to us, we return it back, it's just the way you are in the world for the most part. But when you become a Christian, 
all that gets changed, and now you're loving the unlovable. You're loving. You're doing good for those that hate you, despite you. Amen? And you definitely want to do good for each other, those especially of the body of Christ. Amen? We want the world to see our love for one another. And it's the same in your relationship. Amen? And people need to see your love for one another. Your kids definitely need to see the love you have for each other. Amen? They don't need to see you arguing and fussing and fighting and ignoring each other. One sitting over here, one sitting over here. No, no, that's crazy, man. Repent and get back together, glory to God. And if you're a single parent in here, hey, look, man, you still can show the love of Christ just like if you was married, amen? And really, to be honest with you, if you're single in here, look, just claim Jesus as your husband, hallelujah. He's the best husband, he's the best wife anybody could ask for in the name of Jesus, amen? You don't need another man, you don't need a woman, hallelujah, to, to, to uh, satisfy you or make you complete, glory to God, hallelujah. But if you're married, you don't need to be looking for another one. You don't need to be looking across the street. Well, they just don't love me like I need to be loved. Well, there could be a lot of variables with that right there. It could be you need to change. It could be on your end. Hallelujah. I know yesterday we we got off the expressway, and Belinda really wanted to go somewhere. And, uh, man, we had a really good week all week, man. She was actually reading a book called God Loves Me. We got off the exit, you know, and I was like, hey, hey, hey. I kind of snapped at her a little bit. Man, it's hurt her feelings. Man, man, this whole week, man, we've been in church every day, reading a book on God loves you, and just that one act hurt her heart. So how did that make me feel? It hurt me, amen? It hurt me bad. Now, it's not, well, you know, we're, we're okay, we're fine, all right? But the point is, guys, you should be loving those around you. Pay attention to what they like. Pay attention to what they don't like. And go out of your way to make that happen. Amen? I'm telling you, your relationships are going to be better if you do that. And this ain't about our relationship with each other. It's about Jesus loving us. I know we're going to get there. Hallelujah. Jesus wants us to love each other the same way that he loves us. God's love will change others just like God's love has changed us. How does God love people? This is where it gets to the rubber meets the road right here. How does God love your kids? How does God love your mom and dad? How does God love your spouse? How does God love your family and friends and the world around you? Here is a news flash. Through you and through me. That's how God loves people. It's through us. Now, again, there is those individual times to where you do get love in his presence when you're spending time with him. But for the most part, God has elected to do his will through human beings. That means if your wife is going to, you know, feel the presence of God in a loving way, a lot of it, men, is going to come from you, okay? You're setting her up to be with Abba Father and to feel his presence. The same with your kids. It's about you. Men, it's about us. Men, you, we got to take our place in the home. I'm going to tell you that right now. You've got to be the man of the home. Not this man that just actually, you know, gets a paycheck. And I don't know, forget all that right there, okay? Hallelujah. I mean, man, women can find anybody to give them a paycheck. Okay, that's, that's, not, that's not a big deal. But she needs to know that she is surrounded by somebody that loves her and cares for her more than anything else. Amen? Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, this week we went to the Greater Faith Conference, and when we showed up at the hotel, that ministry that I don't know, and they don't know me. I've listened to all his stuff and all this kind of stuff, but they don't know us. We show up at the hotel, and they had a really nice big old basket for us. Big old basket. Welcome, Pastor Nathan and Belinda. Beautiful basket. It was just beautiful. And Belinda's first thought was, she goes, oh, man, the church sent us that. Why didn't y'all send this to us kids? <laughs> but anyway, we don't know these people. Now, there was probably over 200 and something pastors that came to this thing, and all of them got that. Amen? So they, not only did they raise money, to help somebody else build something, they took up no offerings for themselves at all. Zero money was given to that church this week. Zero. They were constantly giving out. So we show up, we take that basket up there, and we're sitting there looking at it. Man, I'm telling you, man, it touched us. It really did. I'm thinking, wow, this is impressive. Okay? Then we actually, Tuesday night, they had a, a, a dinner for all of the pastors, okay, and, and, and people in ministry. I'm talking five-course meal and I'm talking white glove. I mean, they were serving us like we was in a five-star restaurant. 
Your glass couldn't get about that full. They were already there filling it up. There, take it. I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. And I'm sitting there going, you know, Skillet was there. Y'all, y'all ever heard of Skillet? Okay, yeah, Skillet. Him and his wife were there eating with us. Hallelujah. Uh, Danny Goki, I believe that's his name. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. I mean, hallelujah. He was one of the finalists um, in the American Idol, but he sings for Jesus. Glory to God. And then there was another, Colton Dixon was there. There was a lot of great artists that were there. But anyway, that was just blew us away. Then we get a phone call. I get a text while I'm on the beach Thursday. Hey, they want to do another dinner with y'all tonight. Are y'all okay? <laughs> yeah, man, we're good. The only negative was you're eating at 930 at night. That was bad, okay? That was the only bad thing about it. So we show up Thursday, and they're just loving on us. They didn't cost us a dime. You know how much it cost us to go to the conference? Zero. No money. And they're just investing, pouring into us and others. We had filet mignon. I'm talking filet mignon. Hallelujah. And the chef is the sheriff of, of, of the county in Branson, Missouri. They flew him down there just to cook. The sheriff is the actual chef. Come on, man. But it was just, but my point is, they were lavishing us with love. What do you think that was doing to us? It was changing us. And when you lavish that love on the people around you, it changes them. Hallelujah. Amen. But just know that God is constantly wanting to lavish that love on each one of us. Always. So where does love come from? John tells us in 1 John 4. He says, dear friends, let us continue to love one another for love comes from God. Anyone who loves. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is what? God is love. It ain't God's got love. God is love. It goes on to say, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love, not what, that, that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Today I want to talk to you about how much God does love you. Many people in the church have a dim view of God's love for them. Many think that they have to do good to get his love or be perfect. Many people think that they have to do certain things in order for God to love them. Especially when you screw up. Especially when you sin. When you mess up. Some of y'all have a hard time, just like me. When you mess up and you do something you shouldn't do. It's not easy knowing that God loves you because you just did something stupid, okay? But God loves you even in the midst of your stupidity, in the midst of your sin, the midst of your wrong decision. He loves you anyway, amen? He never stops loving you. What happens is, is we let sin come in, and sin will separate you from the love of God. It will actually draw you away. Not that God's gone anywhere. Your heart, your own flesh will begin to feel bad. The enemy will start putting pressure on you, and you'll feel like you're not good enough. You're not worthy. And then you start drifting away. But God ain't gone nowhere. Matter of fact, God's getting a little closer to you because he wants you to know that, hey, look, your hope is found in him. Amen? He never walks away from you when you mess up. My gosh. If that was the case, I'd have been walking along by myself a lot. Hallelujah. Glory to God. No, God's with us. Amen? Hallelujah. So when did God start loving you and me? Here we go. I hope you're taking notes. We're going all the way back to Genesis, okay? And I want you to hear what God says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Hallelujah. God in his love. We just found out that God is love. It's not that he's got love. He is love. So God in heaven begins to look out through the galaxy, okay? And he begins to think, hmm, I want to do something. I want to do something special. I want to create something. I want to create someone that is actually going to have a will of their own and to choose if they'll serve me and love me. I want to create someone that is very special to me. And that's what he does in Genesis 1. Let's pick it up there. Now, he's already created everything else. We're the last here to be created. He said, then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. That will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. You notice he said male and female. There's no in-between. There's no comma. Okay? You're either a male or you're a female. Okay? Okay? All the way back to the beginning, no matter what people may try. See, people try to screw up with little kids' identity. 
They're trying to get little kids to think there's something else than what God made them. Amen? They're getting adults to think that there's something else than what God created them. This is all lies from the enemy meant to destroy who you really are. The devil has never stopped being the devil, and he never will until he's removed from this earth. He's trying to get something from us. God created me. God created you, and in his image and in his likeness, he looked out through the span of the universe, and he said, I'm going to create somebody like me. That's you. That's me. I mean, man, if you don't get nothing else but to know that, hey, God created you in his image and his likeness, that ends the conversation of how much you're worth. Amen. I mean, that would be like saying, well, I'm not really worth nothing. I'm just, uh, I'm just a dirt spot on the ground out here in earth. Really? Do you think God looks in the mirror and says to himself, you know what? I really don't think I'm nothing. Uh-uh. No. And neither should you and him. You were on his mind in Genesis 1, 26. I was on his mind. At the very beginning, you and I were on his mind. Did we ever stop being on his mind? No, we never stopped being on his mind. And sometimes we do drift, we do things we shouldn't do, and I know it kind of makes it a little bit difficult for us to go back to God because we feel like we've messed up. But honey, I'm telling you, it don't matter how bad you messed up, the one place you need to run is to your daddy. Amen? Because he ain't against you, he's for you, glory to God. And he's always got an answer to help you. Then he goes on to say in verse 28, he says, Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. So, how do we know God loves us? He created us. That's how we know he loved us. And not only did he create us, did you know he didn't say that about the animals? Let's make animals in our image and in our likeness. Uh-uh. That's the only thing you'll ever read in the Bible that was created to be like God. That's you and that's me. Now, I'm not saying you physically look like God or I physically look like God. But deep sin, our spirit is just like God. He created us and greatness is in you. I'm telling you, greatness is on the inside of you. And God is wanting you to walk in that greatness and the enemies want you to walk in failure. Choose greatness. Amen. You're not an accident. Hallelujah. You matter. God loves you so much. And he made you in his image. God made you just like himself. God wanted someone to love and someone that would choose to love him back. So that is why we are here. God wanted someone that he could show his amazing love to every day of the year. And that someone is you, my friend. You may be sitting here going, man, I don't know, man, I don't feel, like I don't feel no love. Give God some time, y'all. I don't care how bad it's been. Just give God a little bit of time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, when I do something, you know, to Belinda, maybe I hurt her feelings. I'm glad she don't just get up and leave. I'm glad she, she gives me time to show her I really love her. Gives me time. Amen. Now, I'm not saying God's going to mess up. He don't mess up. But I'm just saying, don't walk out on God. Just because you messed up, hey, man, that's when his love is needed the most is when you mess up. Amen. Hallelujah. When you make a mistake, something ain't going right. We need his love in that hour. Glory to God. We don't need to run to the bottle, run to the, you know, to the to the bar, run to, you know, TV and, you know, five gallons of ice cream and eat till your mind's, you know, frozen. No, no, we don't need it. We need to run to God and just say, God, I need you. And just stay there for a little while and let his love, man, just surround you and help you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Adam and Eve missed it in sin. Y'all do know that, right? So would have all of us in this room. Hallelujah. We would have done it because that fruit looked good. And you did notice that the fruit that they ate was not on the evil side of the tree. It was on the good side of the tree. See, the devil ain't going to never come to you with something that looks evil. Really? No, my friend. He comes to you like this great salesman. He wants to sell you something that has a lie and is false attached to it. So what does he do? He brings you something that looks good. Maybe it's a hot girl. She looking good. I mean, she looks good. I'm talking about good. All right? I mean, you're talking about this girl. All right? This is an illustration. Okay? I got my hottie. Okay? I got my hottie. But for a single guy that don't have somebody, you got to be careful. This chick comes in, and, man, all you do is looking at the exterior. You don't see that devil that's in her car or in her bedroom. You're checking it out. Whoa, man, anything that good looking has got to be good. Uh-uh, my friend. It's the same thing with a car. 
It's the same thing with a house. It's the same thing with a job opportunity. It's the same thing with friends in your life. The enemy comes to destroy your life, amen? And he ain't coming in a pitchfork and horns and red. Hey, he don't do it. He's going to come to you looking good. Oh, Mom, Dad, you don't know. This is it. This is it. And you're over here going, that ain't it. You want to just go, man, you're crazy, man. You've lost your mind. It ain't just kids. It's adults. Oh, yeah. Now, this is it. This is what we got to do. This is what we got to do. And it ain't nothing but a deception, y'all. How do you know that you're deceived? You don't. You don't know that you're deceived. If you knew that you was being deceived, you wouldn't be deceived. Amen? The enemy packages things up in a really okay package. Y'all have heard me say this, and I'll say it to the day I die. If anything that you're actually, you know, a relationship, a job, anything you're doing in life, if there's some question marks, just hit the pause button, man. That's okay. Pray a little bit longer. Seek a little bit harder. Ask God. Get in with him. Say, God, what would you have me do? Well, Nathan, you know, man, I, I, I've asked my wife. I've asked. You need to talk to him. He knows what you and I don't know. Okay? He, he just does. I don't live this life for the pleasing of a man or a woman. Matter of fact, if I'm getting a lot of applause from people, especially people that ain't going to church, it makes me go, ooh, I might better look at what I'm doing. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. You know how much praise I got by starting a church and going out and, and, and trying to do what I'm doing? Zero. Amen. Hallelujah. I ain't doing it for that, and neither are you. They did something that God told them not to do. Have you ever done something you were not supposed to do? That should be everybody. We've all done it. Was you glad that when you did, God didn't kill you? He didn't slap you, kick you in the butt, kick you off the planet. You know God could do that, right? Boom! Nathan's gone. I'm somewhere in space. God has the power to crush everything and start all over again. And he's had thoughts about it. When he was with Moses, he said, hey, hey, hey. Hey, they're not making that golden calf. Hey, why don't we just go ahead and figure this all out? We'll get rid of it. We'll start a new nation through you. He's had that thought, but he didn't do it. Hallelujah. Because he loves you. And even if he would have started a new nation, I'd have been part of that new nation. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. And so will you have. Hallelujah. No, he loves you when you do good and when you do bad. His love never fails or never ends. It never comes to the end. You're never going to get to a place with God and you go, man, I, I just messed up too much. I've done, I've done messed up too much. He can't, he can't love me no more. Uh -uh. That's when his love really kicks in. When Adam and Eve missed it and were lost our, place, lost our place with God, he never gave up on us. God pursued us with everything he has and made a way for us to be able to come back to him. The way Adam and Eve were in the garden. Jesus tells us how much God loved us in John 3, 16. He said, for God so loved the world, that means people in the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Paul reminds us of this great love in Romans 5, 8. I love this scripture, y'all. You need to underline this in your Bible. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were cussing him, while we had no desire to serve him, I'm telling you, God's love came through Jesus dying and taking all the sins and giving us access to God in the name of Jesus. God has been in love with his kids from the beginning, and that love has not faded at all. He has had you on his mind from your conception in your mother's womb. There is nothing in this world that can separate his love for you at all. I'm telling you guys, from birth, you're a miracle. You're a beer, a miracle, a miracle. Yeah, be good, miracle. You're a miracle from birth. Did you know? Okay, we don't have no kids in here. Okay, everybody's adults, so I can, I can, I can say this. Okay, just basic biology, no big deal. Okay, I'm not gonna say nothing crazy. But when a man and a woman get together, that is how babies are created, y'all. There is no other way. Okay, so when a man and a woman get together, okay. And they are wanting to have a baby. There is from the man sperm that is released into the female. Okay? 
that sperm is like millions of them. And they're all swimming for the prize. The egg. Get out of here. I got to get to this egg. Get, I got to go. I mean, they're trying to get to the egg. Okay? But did you know that, that many of them never make it through the canal? They never make it. Gets narrowed down to where, man, we just have a few ones left. It's a race, baby, okay? Then all of a sudden, they hit that egg. And then that one that's blessed, it gets in the egg. And that's you, and that's me. There was a million other people trying to get your spot. That's good. I don't care what you say. It's good, okay? I'm telling you, it's good. That's a good example, okay? I'm telling you, whether y'all clap, whether y'all like it or not, that's a good example. You was a miracle from birth. I'm telling you, you was a miracle from birth. And I'm no biology teacher, but that's pretty good. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Let's get on to the message here. But it's true. I mean, if you really think about it, you are a miracle. Okay? Because there could have been many others that took your place, but you made it. Never think less of you. You are not an accident. You are here on purpose for a purpose. In Jesus' name, glory to God. Hallelujah. Paul tells us in Romans 8, 35, he says, Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? That's a question. Is there ever going to be a day that we wake up and go, Hmm, Christ don't love us no more. Uh-uh. I don't care where you're at, what, you, what you've done, or where, you, where you've been through. Does it mean... Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity? No. Or are persecuted? No. Are hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scripture says, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life. Neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. How many of y'all have ever had worries? How many of you have ever had fears? Hallelujah. God is close to you in that moment. Amen. He's right there. He's wanting you just to reach to him, okay? And say, hey, God, help me. Hallelujah. And he will help you. I promise you. Glory to God. It goes on to say, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Is there ever a day that God does not love you? No, there's never a day. God loves you so much, and he wants to help you through this life. He knows it can be hard and difficult, so that is why he wants to help us. His help will come with instructions on how to make life right. Those instructions will help us if we do them. God will love us no matter what, but it will hurt his heart to see us disobey what he desires for us to do. The reason is that it will cost us dearly to not do what he wants us to do. I mean, I'm telling you something, guys. This is a fact that when you do something that is against the instruction God gave you, it's not going to bode well with you. And because God loves you so much, he don't want to see you continue to go that way. That's why he works hard at keeping us on the straight and narrow. Because wide and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many, 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 many people go in that way. And he don't want to see that. Amen? If me and Belinda, we're married, okay, and we're in this marriage covenant, and if Belinda comes to me and says, Nathan, I want you to do this, this, and this. She gives me instruction that I know if I do, it's going to bring her joy. Am I not going to work my tail off to do that for her? If I love her, I'm going to do it. Amen. I'm not going to avoid that. Nah, baby, I'm going to do what I want to do. Shut up. Go over there. I'm good. No, nah, baby, I really don't want you to do this. I don't care what you want. I'm going to do what I want to do. Okay? You do what you want to do. I'll do what I want to do. Is this marriage going to work? No, it's not going to work. Okay? Well, see, with God, he loves us so emphatically crazy that he will stay with us when all by rights he should leave us because we've given him plenty of opportunity to do so. Because we don't want to do what he tells us to do. This Bible right here is full of instruction. Is it for his good or is it for our good? It's for our good. And for whatever reason, his creation, the ones he, he, he Jesus died for, the ones he loved so much, will avoid the actual basic 
instructions for life. And look at other instructions. And, and look for other ways to do life. And the one who died for you, the one who has been chasing you since you was born, the one who was with you in your mother's womb, is trying to get you and me to do what is right. Because he what? Loves us. He loves us. And the very fact that he wants us to do it because he knows somebody out there hates you. Somebody's trying to kill, steal, and destroy you. And he knows that if you don't do the instruction he gives you, it leaves you open to be destroyed. And there ain't nothing he can do about it. Your life and my life is my own. He's not going to make you do right things. He's not. He wants to. <laughs> but he's not going to make us. We have a free will. And how many people have chosen not to believe in him and are no longer with us today? They're in hell burning right now. And if you think God is happy about that, you don't understand what it's like to be a mom or a daddy. Ain't nobody happy about that. Nobody likes to see their kid in jail. Nobody likes to see their kid, you know, incarcerated. Nobody likes to see their kid fail in life. If you do, you're a sick parent. And you need to be shot. I mean it. We don't have any of that in here. But seriously, your Heavenly Father loves you. And He wants all of us to do what He's asked us to do. And it starts with basic one-on-one, coming to church. Right there. That's basic one-on-one. He said, forsake not the assembling together of yourselves, such as the manner of some have. Just simply that right there. Come to church. Well, I ain't got to go to church. Big Christian, I tell you what, I mean, people don't talk about going to church. I did not tell you that. <laughs> That's your heavenly Father giving you instruction for life. Either you obey or you don't obey. Hallelujah. But the consequences is going to be on you, sweetheart. And God don't want that. Let's do what God, when he comes to you and whispers something in your ear, don't do that. That's you and him. And how many times do you hear people that do something and they make this statement? Man, I wish I wouldn't have done that. You know, man, I knew I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, there was something telling me. <laughs> yeah, that something's God. It goes on all the time, y'all, because he loves us. He loves us, and he don't want to lose us. Just like her telling me, hey, sweetheart, do this, this, and this. She loves me. She don't want to lose me. And she knows that if I'm going to continue to do what I want to do, it's going to violate. It's going to, it's going to keep it to where I'm, 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 I'm walking away from her. She's not walking away from me. I'm walking away from her because I'm choosing my own life. You don't need to do that. Hallelujah. You know, the Bible says um, in Hebrews 4, verse 14, some of my favorite passages. Says, so then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious Father. There, will be, there we will receive mercy, and we will find grace to help us in a time of need. This is Jesus, y'all. He knows what it's like to go through what you're going through. If there's anybody in this, you know, world that knows what it's like to lose their son and daughter to sin or bad decisions, God lost Adam and Eve. He lost Adam and Eve. And they were perfect. So, again, if God can't control two perfect created beings to get them to do the right thing, what's, what makes you think we're going to be able to do that? Your kids and my kids are their own. They're going to make their own decisions. They're going to do their own things. But what did God do with Adam and Eve? Did he give up on them? Mm -mm. He kept chasing them. He kept chasing them. Though they did lose their place, okay, God fought for the relationship to continue to be strong. He loved his two kids, and he loved them, and he still loves them. Hallelujah. He don't give up on his kids. Jesus experienced what it was like to live down here, and he was tempted in every way just as we are, and he did not sin. That is why we need to run to him when we miss it and let his love restore us, redeem us from the sin that is trying to destroy us. Jesus gave us a beautiful picture of God's love in Luke 15 as we close. I want to read this beautiful story, and then we're going to close. And just know that God, goodness is what leads men to repentance. 
It's his love. It's his goodness that leads us to repentance. It is the devil trying to sell us the pleasure of sin to destroy us. See, sin, sin destroys. Love restores. Love empowers. Sin will destroy your life. Hallelujah. Love will keep your life strong. Amen. Luke 15, 11, And this is for everybody in the room. I'm telling you, this is a beautiful picture of God's love. As we open up this chapter in Luke 15, remember the story. He talks about the one sheep, you know, the sheep that got lost out of the 99. And, and said, would, would, would he leave the 99 to go get the one? Yes, he went and got the one. Hallelujah. And when they found it, they all partied and rejoiced because the one came home. Then we see the same in the next parable. He said, you know, what about the woman that lost the coin? You know what I'm saying? She's looking for this coin. Had some friends come help her with the coin. They found the coin. Hallelujah. They all rejoiced because she found the coin. Hallelujah. That lost coin had came back hallelujah but then he takes it to a whole nother level y'all and he starts talking about people hallelujah and he talks about the father and the son in verse 11 it says to illustrate the point of people coming home hallelujah or being found jesus told them this story he said a man had two sons the younger son told his father i want my share of your estate now before you die so his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons a few days later this was this was bad in their day just a little FYI, okay? The younger never asked for the inheritance of the father before he died. That was an insult, okay? You were to wait till the father passed before you got that inheritance. But a, but a few days later, this younger son, after he got his inheritance, packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. Now, I want you to pay attention to this story. Did God, did this man run after his younger son? I want you to understand what's going on here. He did not. Okay? He let him take his money and go on. About the time his money ran out, see, sometimes people just got to have their money run out. <laughs> sometimes, hey, look, you just keep praying for your lost loved one. Just keep praying for them. Trust me. I'm telling you, your prayers are going to make a difference in them coming back home. And he said, uh, about the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. You know, when you're hungry, you start looking for options. <laughs> Hallelujah. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have enough food to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son, so please take me on as a hired servant. We see that every day. Well, you know what? I'm going to go back to church. But man, I really don't. You know, I don't feel like I belong. I don't feel like I, I'm worthy to go. I'm, I'm going I'm to do this. I'm going to do that. Notice this right here in verse 20. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with what? Love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. And there's much to say about that right there, but not right now. And kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. The father was expecting. He was on the porch praying for his son, expecting his son to come back home. He probably stayed on that porch. We don't know how long he was on that porch, but he was looking for something. Because at a distance, he seen his son coming. And he left the porch and ran to his son and said, hey, 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 man, welcome home, man. You are loved. You ain't got to repent. You are home with me. Come to me. Let me have a party with you. Let's celebrate you coming back home. But I'm telling you this, guys. We must be like the Father. We got to stand our ground. We got to be strong. We got to continue to pray. Seek God. Pray for them. Call their name out and believe that God is bringing them to you. Amen. Don't doubt. Don't watch your words in this time. When something happens in your life, watch what you say. What you say can and will be used against you. Don't be talking about your, your kids. Man, my kids, they're crazy. I don't know what's wrong with them. He's stupid, man. He don't know what he's doing. Don't you be saying that about any of your kids, anybody. 
No, you look at your kid. It don't matter how stupid they are. Say, no, my kid is loved by God. He's the righteousness of God. I call him saved. I call him filled with the Spirit of God. I call him back home. He's coming in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And you don't let go of that. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Meanwhile, in verse 25, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants, what's going on? He said, your brother's back, he was told. And your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. I believe this calf right here had his son's name on it. That's just me. But I believe this calf had his son's name on it. And we're going to fatten you up, baby, because my boy's coming back home. He's coming back home. I'm going to fatten you up. And when he comes, we're going to slice you and grease and play mignon. It goes to show you we should be eating meat. I tell you, man, I'm telling you, not no fake meat. Hallelujah. We're going to eat real deal. Hallelujah. He says, your brother's back, he was told, and your father has killed this fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, all these years I have slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast for my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back, after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fatted calves. That is the church that we're never going to be. Ever. Okay? And if I ever hear somebody having this, uh, the older son's mentality, I'm going to ask you to find another church. Because I'm telling you, we're always looking for the son to come home, the daughter to come home. And I don't care what they've done. I don't care where they've been. They're going to come in here and they're going to experience the fattened calf, the ring on your finger, the robe of righteousness put around you in Jesus' name. Because you are a daughter and son of God. Amen. We ain't judging nobody. Make them feel bad. Hallelujah. Most of those people that are that way, they living in sin. I'm serious. Well, anyway, hallelujah. So, they, so uh, verse 31, his father said to him, look, dear son. You have always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. There was a celebration. Does God celebrate you being lost? No. It hurts him. What does he celebrate? When you've been found, my friend. When he has actually got you, hallelujah. When you've come back home. And he don't just celebrate lightly. He has a party, man. He does have a party. Now, again, the key in this is don't be like the younger and don't be like the older. (laughs) Don't be like the younger and get your uh, blessing from God and run and go live in the world. Don't do that. Amen? All right? And don't be like the older and be the one judging everybody who did. I can't believe they do that. I can't believe they do that. You know what I'm saying? No, you righteous nutcase. You know what I'm saying? You're you're nuts. Okay? We're, We're not a part of that. There's nobody in this church that's greater than anybody else. Nobody. Period. And it starts right here. I'm no, 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 no. I'm just like you. Okay? I breathe just like you. I put on clothes just like you. I get dirty just like you. I make mistakes like everybody else. I'm not perfect. But I serve a perfect God and so do you. Amen? And I want you to know that I don't care what the enemy's been telling you. You are loved by God. He loves you, friend. He loves you. And I'm telling you what, just know that no matter what we go through this life, and we're going to go through some stuff, y'all. We're going to go through some stuff. Y'all know that. We're going to go through some stuff. As long as we're in this world, we're going to face trials, tests, and tribulations. You're going to. So don't be shocked when your world's turned upside down. Just know that there's actually other people that have had the same thing happen. Glory to God. All right? Think about Samuel over there. Don't, you know, you start having a bad day, just pull up Samuel's uh, Facebook page. Oh, by the way, hey, Samuel, how you doing? We love you. He actually plays the service in front of his church at night. Hallelujah. Because they're about eight hours different from us. Anyway, but look, go look at somebody else's lifestyle. Go look at what somebody else is going through. Okay? I mean, he's looking at 130 orphans that don't have no food, don't have no uh, 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 game box, don't have no motorcycle. Don't have all the, the, the neat little things that kids have today. Amen? Just go, go look at some people and see what they're waiting through. Amen? That'll let you know that, hey, look, there's people in this life that are going through hell. Amen? And they need people to help them get out of it. And this is what this church is about. Amen? Yes, your emotions are going to be attacked. Yes, you're going to face things. Man, you're going to go through things. But you don't need to go to a place that's going to make it worse. You need to go to a place that's going to lift you up. Amen? And help you out. Glory to God. And that's what you have here at this church. There's people in this church that are that way. They'll help you out. You can call them and say, hey, man, Miss Cindy, I'm going through some stuff. 
You ain't going to hear Miss Cindy go. Better not. <laughs> well, you know, I'm going through the same thing. Dear God, man, I don't know, man. It's been rough. No, you're not going to hear that. And if you do, then both of y'all need to call somebody else. <laughs> and we get you on three-way call. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But look, man, cheer up and know God's got you. He's with you. And if you got God, you got everything, man. You don't need nothing else. If you got God, you got everything. Hallelujah. He's not just around you, but he's in you, living in you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And he will help you overcome everything in life. Can I get an amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Y'all awake in here? I know it's 12-12. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm negative 32 seconds right now. 34, 35. I'm going in the hole. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I want everybody to bow your head and close your eyes. Let's pray real quick. Hallelujah. Glory to God. While we were yet sinners, while we were lost in our own sin, 